What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the podcast. This is Real Talk with Zuby. For the first time ever, this is broadcasting live on Facebook. If you happen to be tuning into the live stream, normally it's pre recorded, edited, but this time we're going big, we're going for it live. And we have no one other than the wonderful Posey Parker, who is a women's rights advocate. She is also a wife, and she is also a mother. Welcome to the show, Posey. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm great, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Did I do okay on the intro there? Is there anything that I missed out? Uh, no. No, you did good. Awesome. So why don't you introduce yourself to the audience, Posey, for those who do not know you? Okay, so I uh, campaign specifically around the word woman for women uh, to protect our rights. Uh, because if we can't be named, we can't be protected. And by virtue of protecting women's rights, we also um, protect men's rights and children's rights. And when I say men's rights, I mean your right to assemble freely and choose to, to assemble without women, just as much as women would very much like sometimes you all not to be around too. Uh, and then another extension of um, my campaign is protecting children's rights and their rights to have their bodies fully intact uh, until they so desire when they're fully fledged adults. So that's what I do. And the big thing that I did was a billboard with the dictionary definition of woman. Um, and I, I did that and it was removed for hate speech. Okay, so that billboard is represented um, by what you're standing in front of right now. For anyone who's watching the live video, Right now, Posey is standing in front of a banner which says woman, adult, human, female. So it's the dictionary definition there. So tell us, Posey, why is that deemed so controversial among certain people? Um, because it excludes men. Um, and those men will be the men that decide they, they are women, that think they're women, that have this delude, no, deluded notion that not only can they call themselves women, but that other people must go along with what they say. So that's that, That's who is excluded from the dictionary definition of woman. So you're saying you don't recognize my British female powerlifting records is what you're saying? I'm really sorry, I don't know. Deeply I don't recognize any of it, I don't recognize <laughs> I think if you're, if you're born with a penis, you will never be female or a woman or anything. You, you born male, you die male and that's it. So why is why do you think in 2019 that is such a deeply controversial opinion to many? Um, for a variety of reasons, I think that predominantly the movement is being led by heterosexual and heterosexual men. Maybe they just don't feel special enough, uh, and so when they decide to uh, wear women's clothing in their sort of 40s and 50s. Uh, they want to be part of a community of the LGBT. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons. I think we also have coercive and uh, manipulative forces on the internet. Um, I think perhaps we're in an age in the West of luxury. And so there's a little lack of purpose in life. So people are looking far too inward for purpose as opposed to what, what they can do to be a productive member of society, they're thinking, what can society do uh, for them? <laughs> it's a bit of yeah. a tense moment, but um, you know, that, that's where I think we are. It's a, it's a huge number of forces that have all aligned at the same really messy moment to create this bizarre phenomenon. Mm. So to play, um, to play a devil's advocate here. So, I mean, I, I agree with you there. I respect and recognize biology and I understand that there are people and I can have compassion for them who, you know, feel that they don't fit in in the world or they feel like their gender is not what it should be or they feel like they're a different gender or that they're gender fluid or what, whatever the case may be. But I think with you specifically and with myself as well, this is um, a position I share, is that the, the danger comes with one, when these ideas begin to encroach on children, people who are underage and shouldn't be making, you know, people who cannot give consent to 
do most lots of things that adults do, but yeah. certain ideas and acts essentially are being pushed on them. This includes having their hormones altered. This includes having surgeries which change their body. Yeah. And then also in other areas, obvious ones that would stand out to me, I mean, Needless to say, a couple of weeks ago to anybody who saw it, I literally identified as a woman during a gym session and then proceeded to break multiple British women's powerlifting records. And the video went incredibly viral. It's made national and international news. And funnily enough, I've become entangled in this whole conversation somewhat by accident from something that I just thought was a satirical tongue in cheek video that I, I posted on Twitter. But um. It's, ha it's had a lot of repercussions because this is a genuine discussion. I mean, to put it simply, my personal position is that adults can, you know, as long as you're not harming other people, then adults can generally, as far as I'm concerned, do what they want with themselves and their own bodies. It doesn't mean I think everything is a good idea or that some things are not harmful, but that's kind of my general position. However, once that starts imposing on the will, the rights, the beliefs, the actions of other people. And that would include, um, for example, male to female transgender athletes competing in women's sports. That would include things like changing rooms. That would include things like women's prisons, where there is, as far as I'm concerned, a very obvious safety risk. And it's not men that this is really going to harm. It is primarily women, and I think it's funny that I've been. Uh, <laughs> I think it's funny that I've been dragged into this conversation because I'm. I'm. I wouldn't say I'm. I'm known for it, but I'm not known to be um, someone who considers himself a, a feminist in, in any way of the word. So it's kind of funny how I've found myself over the past couple of weeks taking this fairly hardline position and um, being demonized by some, being lauded by others for sticking up for women. So I found myself in a little bit of a bizarre situation. So tell me, Posey, is that sort of roughly along the same line as your views? What are what are your views on this whole area? I really don't, I, I can't, to be really honest with you, I, I'm so insulted by men who um, wear women's clothing. I find it an absolute personal um, affront, but it's still none of my business. But I, I think that it's overwhelmingly insulting to women just to think that um, you can put whatever you want on and then you become a woman. It sort of, it really goes against what I believe being a woman is, which is literally bio, my biology. You know, I do conform to uh, my sex stereotype. I do wear far too much makeup mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and I, I do, I, I'm, I, Outwardly, I'm incredibly feminine, but I, you know, that then I've got a personality, and that's nothing to do with really whether I'm male or female. Um, but I, I, you know, it, it's none of my business, and I can't stop anyone from doing whatever they want when they're adults. But I'm not going to pretend that I, I don't feel um, I think offended's too big a word because that makes me out to be some sort of victim, and I'm not. I find it distasteful when I see a male to female uh, walking down the street with, you know, women's clothing on, either looking like something that their mother would have worn or something they saw in the 90s, 1980s movies um, with a, a street working prostitute. You know, those, those are the two stereotypes these men seem to go for. But what, when it gets bad uh, is the kids and you know men thinking that they then can encroach upon women's spaces or sports or prisons or anything. Mm. So what's been the general reaction to your position and your message? Um, well the trunes or the trans rights activists have been very upset and that will be allies that will be the sort of people that use stupid language like cisgender. Um, those people absolutely hate me um and then there's <laughs> there's a few women um on my side of the debate that also think my some of my methods are not wise um and i have precious little time for that uh 
But generally speaking, normal, what I would call run-of-the-mill normal people, people that worry about paying their mortgage, people that do, you know, a range of sort of proper go-to-work, nine-to-five everyday jobs, those people, those people are absolutely on board and get it. There's not, and men more than women, actually. Uh, I don't know what that says about women, but women are far more likely to sort of do a head tilt and, oh, isn't Joanne brave for putting her daughter and now son on puberty blockers. Mm. You know, women that endorse these behaviours, um, I think we're probably more predisposed to Munchausen's by proxy as well, but that's just a guess. <laughs> so, um, yeah, predominantly I get messages from all over the world, from everywhere, from Jamaica to Japan, um, New Zealand, America, Canada. Uh, you know, it's desperate in many, many countries. The, the situation is really desperate for women's rights. Mm, that that's really interesting. I mean, based on what I know about psychology and just general personality traits and differences, I would say that the reason why you're more likely to have support from a majority of men rather than women in this position is, I think, largely due to um, two components. One would be compassion, which I mean, I think compassion is a great thing, but I do think that it can be misguided and short-sighted in some cases. And it is known that on average, you know, I, I always, this is a generalization here because you'll always have someone go, oh, wait, hang on. No, that's, I know someone who violates that. On average, women are more compassionate than men are just in terms of the personality trait that mm. goes across the board, across the world. So it, it wouldn't surprise me that it would slightly tilt in the direction of men kind of being a little more understanding and supportive of it. And yeah, it's... um. And then the other one was is the fact that um, they've actually done studies on this showing that women on average are care more about political correctness than men do. So, so I'm kind of, saying because it's really anti-women. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> as I said, it's, uh, it, it's, it's funny. So I'd imagine, I mean, you can tell me if this is true. I, I can imagine you'd probably, you're probably getting quite a lot of um, support and agreement from <laughs> people who I guess some people might consider evil right wingers or those horrible conservatives and all that all that kind of stuff more than the liberal side of the spectrum would that be accurate to say well I said it's a, there's people that are just entirely peed off with how the left has treated them mm. and how the misogyny that they never saw before has has shown itself um, and can't really go back in its box uh, you know, when you've had somebody tell you, when you've had a, a woke bro tell you that you don't know what a woman is, and they do, that mm -hmm. kind of puts you off your political stance. But yes, uh, people on the right, I think, are a little less on board with LGB, let alone LGB, pretend you're something, T. So, um, yeah, it's... It's there's a lot of very dis disenfranchised people, particularly women on the left, and there's a lot of men on the left that can't are so excited that they get to fully insult and threaten women on the left because now they have a new way to do it. You know, it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's okay to do it now. Yeah, it's it's the whole thing is very very strange. I mean, I don't want to get too far off topic, but I know that that. People are feeling that way, not just in terms of gender stuff, but, you know, same with like things like race and racism. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've had the most, the most, I'm very, I'm very active on Twitter and social media and the attacks I get generally are from, it's always from the liberal end of the spectrum. It's from the people who call themselves tolerant. I yeah. mean, I've, I've been called all kinds of stuff, including stuff that isn't even possible given what I look like and where I'm from. You know, I've been called a white supremacist by a white guy on Twitter. And I'm like, do you not see how utterly stupid and ridiculous what you just said is, especially when the conversation had nothing to even do with that topic. It was just like, oh, this is a guy I disagree with. Mm -hmm. So even if <laughs> even if he can't be a Nazi or a white supremacist because he's clearly black, he, he, he must be anyway because he he disagrees with me on this thing, and I've I've talked I've spoken to a lot of people, including some on the podcast, who typically, more traditionally, would consider themselves 
to be more on the left end of the political spectrum or consider themselves more liberal or whatever terminology you want to use. But they themselves are like, this stuff, lots of these things are just getting out of hand. People are being, that's the side that a lot of the intol the genuine intolerance and genuine bigotry and sexism and racism and all these other things which people claim to be vehemently opposed to, it's like they're so blind and caught up in certain ideologies and ideas that they can't just go, oh, wait, hang on, I'm being a little bit hypocritical here. Um, maybe, you know, and I've seen it for years. I mean, I'm not someone who, um, I don't like to label myself po politically. I'm largely somewhat libertarian, but I'm certainly more to the right end than I am to the left end. And I always have been. Some people think I've kind of shifted or something. It's like, no, I haven't shifted. I've just become a little bit more outspoken on certain issues as some of this madness gain steam. And I'm kind of like, okay, I can't really sit back here quietly. I've got to push back against certain things. You know, I, um, I mean, you're, you're a mother. We can, we can talk about that a little bit, but, um, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a parent yet, but I've, I come from a very big family, lots of men, lots of women. I've got lots of nieces, lots of nephews. And the notion that my nieces might grow up and they'll have some guy who looks like me, um, <laughs> c competing with them directly in sport. And that's just supposed, that that's supposed to be fine. And no one is supposed to say anything against that. I'm kind of like, no, hang on. This is not about, this is not about bigotry. This is not about any phobia. This is not about hatred for any individual or group. I want to be very clear about this. This is just about basic fairness, right? It's, it's not a complex it's been made to be some super complicated issue, but I'm just like, why is this why is this a debate? We know that men, especially at a professional level, if you're going to take the strongest people in the world, you're going to take the fastest people, the people who jump the highest, hit the hardest, they're all going to be men without fail, all of them. That, that's cool. that's, yeah, that's biology, and we, we know that. So why are we going to suddenly just ignore these facts and not think about what the long-term repercussions of that will be? So, yeah, it's bizarre to me. It's weird. No, I, I, I do one. Well, I think what's happened actually is the people that want to benefit from this nonsense, they've done the legwork long before anybody was really worried about it. So I knew about the Olympics allowing uh, men to compete as women as long as their testosterone levels were still about fifty times higher than women's, but. Uh, and I'm exaggerating, but I knew that back in 2015, but it wasn't being talked about because these little things, what they do is they go and change the structure of something when it doesn't really matter. So what did it matter in 2015 if you let the odd man who said he was a woman who couldn't be detected, um, you know, usually I can spot somebody who is born male from a country mile, you know, these, this sort of notion of passing, I don't think I've ever seen a man in the flesh who looks remotely like a woman, no matter how much makeup or women's clothing or how his voice is or whatever, I don't think any of them pass. But um, they, they did the work. So they, they changed the Olympic, um, the International Olympic Committee's rules ages ago. Uh, half of the Iranian women's football team are male. Mm, I did see that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bizarre like uh it's so odd because sometimes i'm just like am i i sometimes feel like i live in some sort of parallel universe or matrix or something especially when i see uh i mean with my viral deadlift video about 99 percent of the comments were either people just finding it funny or people saying yes this is amazing thank you for making a mm. clear thank you for making an important point but in a way that is amusing and you know is not hateful in, in any sort of way or angry or anything like that because it clearly wasn't and then one percent of the responses which is a lot because <laughs> it got over 15 million impressions so you know one percent of those is, is still a lot but there, there were certain people just arguing you know of course there's the standard one just trying to call me names or insult me or say that i'm some kind of hateful bigot or something like that which in itself is rather ironic because uh, you know, I don't know if I don't know if you saw the original video, but at the bottom I put um, basically anyone who disagrees with me or says that I wasn't a woman at the time of this video is being a bigot by by their own logic. 
So it was it was kind of funny because anyone who said something about it, I could just say, well, you you yourself are are now being transphobic because you're you you said that I could identify as whatever I want, and now that I've gone and done it, you're now saying that I'm that I didn't mean it or that I'm taking the piss or that I'm not actually a woman. And it's like, well, how how does this how does this weigh up here? I thought you just said that. I can be whatever I want to identify as, and I don't even need to be. Um, I don't even need to be consistent with it because there's the whole idea of gender fluidity. So, depending on the day of the week, or my feelings, or my emotions at the time, I could say that, you know, when I go to the gym, I do actually identify as a woman. Every time I want to break a record, I do genuinely feel like a woman in that moment. So, give me my world records. I, I just don't believe these people that profess to believe this rubbish actually believe it i don't i don't think it's possible to think that someone like rachel mckinnon the um very mediocre male cyclist who's winning women's championships i don't think he genuinely hangs out at home believing he's a woman i don't think he sees a woman in the mirror um i just don't i don't buy any of it they're just it's it's really odd it it makes no sense. It is odd. I mean, the thing is, people can be, this is something I've, especially when I when I look at history, something that I truly believe is that people can be led, made, indoctrinated, brainwashed, whatever the word is, people can be led to believe pretty much anything. Yeah. Pretty much anything. I mean, we've, we've got, you know, you've, it's 2019 and you've got an increasing number of people who genuinely believe the earth is flat. You know, that's a different, that different, true. right? It's a different topic, but it's like they genuinely, I mean, I've spoke, I've spoken to a couple of people and, and it's not, it's not a joke. It's like, no, they genuinely believe the earth is flat and that everyone else is just deluded and being lied to. You have people who believe that the entire world is, um, is, is just, you know, some sort of power struggle. You know, you've got this very sort of Marxist idea that, everything it doesn't matter it can be male female black white um straight gay what whatever rich poor whatever thing they want to separate it by and they just see the entire world every action every world word everything is just this sort of battle for power and based on this same logic you have you have all these people you know make come saying these crazy ideas for example that only white people can be racist only males, only men can be sexist, right? It, it's, it's impossible for a woman to be sexist. It's impossible for a black person or an Asian person or a Jewish person to be racist, which is weird because whites are actually a minority globally. So that's kind of strange. But the whole notion, you're just, and they really, you know, and, there's, and there are intelligent people, there are professors, there are, there are smart people who, who believe this stuff. And it's it's odd to me because I'm just like, it, it's cool to have an opinion. You can have an opinion on things, right? But some things you're just like, but that doesn't make sense. You know, it's it's like it doesn't it doesn't make sense. Like I I don't I don't well, get it. It's very different with the little kids. Like I I when I went to America, there was um I mean there's a there's a woman. I think her daughter is called Penelope, and she talks very earnestly and she said when Penelope was three she said you know I, I don't think I'm a boy I am a boy and she said and you know I just I mean what can you do that was it I just thought what do you mean what can you do <laughs> well you just ignore it and you go all right darling yeah sure sure you are and you yeah. carry on with your day and then in about a week's time, that three-year-old's forgotten they've ever said it. Mm. You know, it was, um, I think there was a BBC story, and this woman said her son came out of the bath when he, when he was seven, and he came out of the bath and he said he wanted two towels because he was, he was a girl. And she said she gave him a hug, and then she couldn't sleep all night. And I just thought, he just wanted two towels. You know, he didn't sort of go in the bath with a with a, a knife and cut off his genitals. He literally just said, "Mummy, I want two towels because I want to." And then she said, "I reflected," and he had sometimes plays with girls' toys, and he did sometimes put my shoes on, 
And I just thought, yeah, my, my cousin who was in the Paris used to do that, you know, put his mother's shoes on and use his brick trolley as some sort of thing for his action men, like a pram. Um, but this, this idea that your child would say something like that and then you indoctrinate them into believing they can change sex, I think is absolutely disgusting. It's mm. just an awful thing to do to a child because it's a lie. And it doesn't matter whether that ideology or that dogmatic view, it doesn't matter how much you hold that belief, you literally cannot change sex. And what these children will end up with is, A, once you take puberty blockers, you are no longer a sexually functioning human. So you will never go through a puberty that renders you somebody who can have a sexually active life. That's one. Uh, two, if you bind your breasts or if you have them sliced off, that causes all sorts of damage and harm. I mean, clearly, if you have a mastectomy, you don't have any breasts. And also what happens is certain other parts of that part of your body fall off. Because mm. once you um, cut away the nipple and try and stick it back on, it often just dies. And then if you go further with the sex reassignment surgery, uh, usually from male to female, everything that gets turned inside out goes rock hard eventually. And you have to dilate for hours. So you have it's very painful and they fail. These surgeries fail all the time. Um, and then if girl to boy, uh, you have the whole of your forearm stripped, so all of the flesh of your forearm, mm. and then they create something that's supposed to be a phallus. And then to repair your forearm, because it's less hairy than your thigh, they'll cut a piece of your thigh off that often dies, and they will stick that on your forearm. And there was one young lady I was reading about, and she'd had 31 corrective surgeries wow. in America. And she ended up urinating out of the wrong orifice and she had a colostomy bag. Now, this is something we're doing, not, and this absolute lies about um, suicide. None of that is true. There's not a great number, there's a, not a big spike. And the number of people that commit suicide prior to transition is the same number after. Mm, yeah, I've, re I've read that. It's uh, roughly 40%, which is extraordinarily high. That's the number I've seen. I don't know if that's right. Well, I don't think that's true. For teenagers, it's not true at all. There is okay. no suicide ideation, and charities like the Samaritans will tell you that to talk about suicide as part of a condition actually encourages people to think they're, they are suicidal. Mm. So Bristol University recently had a spate of suicides, and it was kept out of all the media because suicide does spread. Yeah, it does. This copy, copycat sort of syndrome. Yeah. So... In the teenagers, there isn't. But also what we have to think is if you're so, if you're, if you think that your genitals or the way you're perceived in society is something that causes you such great distress that you want to mutilate your body, then I'm going to guess that that's not your only mental health issue. And so I don't know if we can peel away gender dysphoria, and I don't think most heterosexual men who wear dresses have gender dysphoria at all. I think they're just walking around exercising their fetish. But um, you, you just, we just can't be sure of anything at the moment, and we're not allowed to research, obviously, because then that will just unravel. The whole mm -hmm. ideology will just unravel if we do any research into it. Yeah. Oh, that uh, that procedure you de defined there sounded pretty horrifying. I want to say, I mean, from a again, like to reiterate, from a political, very laissez-faire libertarian perspective, if an if a grown adult wants to do any form of mutilation to their body, if they want to remove their entire hand, they yeah. want they want to amputate a leg, I think it's a terrible idea. Personally, I don't think I don't think people should do that. From a legal perspective, I'm kind of like. Okay, buddy, if, if you want, if you're sure you want to chop your leg off, I am not going to stop you. However, yeah. like I said, when it comes to children, you're talking about people who are not, the whole point of being a child from a legal perspective is that you cannot consent, right? Yeah. You, you can't consent to sex. You can't consent to drinking. You can't drive. You can't join the army. There's a whole ton of stuff. You can't work, right? There's a whole ton of stuff you cannot do 
as a child because your prefrontal cortex of your brain is not fully developed. You're not an adult human being. So you can't make certain choices, especially permanent ones. What's that? Don't you think it's going to, I think what's going to happen, you see, is once we allow children capacity to consent over what their body can look like, and we, they can consent to puberty. Why can't they consent to having sex? Yeah, it's it sounds so dark, and it, it I've thought about that as well. I have thought about that that some some of these things are just being used as a as a Trojan horse. For, Absolutely. Yeah, literally for pedophilia to put it simply. I mean, you're already seeing it. You're already seeing it. There's that there's that kid they're trying to make famous in America, who they they're calling like a drag kid, who's literally, you know, he's been dancing. He's like twelve. He's been dancing in like gay male strip clubs and going on TV and makeup and heels. And I'm, and people are there like clapping and saying, this is brilliant. And look, we've become so progressive and accepting as a society. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, what? And people are like, oh, you know, you get people, oh, you're so conservative. I'm like, look, if that, if that's what makes me a, cons if that makes me a conservative in 2019, I will take the label. I will be like, okay, cool. I am a conservative. If, if this is, if just, you know, like standing for sanity, uh, makes me a conservative, then I'm like, okay, fair enough. Like, call me whatever, you know. But this is wrong. Like, it, it's wrong, like, and it's it's a child. Again, if if a twenty year old, if a twenty year old drag queen wants to dance around in a strip club, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. that's consenting adults. But a child? I mean, imagine if it was a was a little biological girl. Would we be? If it was a little girl, would we be saying the same thing? They're dancing and stripping for grown men. Would we be saying, oh, this is brilliant. This is progressive. I think not. I, 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 don't, I don't get it. At the same time as we're sort of talking about Michael Jackson, or how did, no, how did we not know that a man that, bought a, that built a theme park for kids and had sleepovers with children, and everyone sort of agreeing that it was disgusting that we just let this happen, and at the same time we've got a little boy, Desmond, the chap you're talking about, sitting under a picture of a boy face down with, with Rahitnal written on this picture, and the guy that he's interviewing with, one of them has done, has been in prison for murder. So, and then another time he's talking about ketamine. Then there's another boy called Lactatia. Um, what a name. Uh, he's picked, well, that's his drag name. And he's pictured with um, one of the winners of RuPaul's Drag Race. And the guy's got no clothes on. And this kid is maybe nine in the picture. Mm. And you just, you just wonder... Like, you know, going back to the, the surgery thing, I just wanted to say one thing. We are, as taxpayers in the United Kingdom, the legal thing and what you're allowed to do to your body, I don't think the NHS should cover sex reassignment surgery. Oh, no, no way. No way. I don't even think that should be, um, well, I guess everything is controversial, but no, no chance. No. And the puberty blockers um, is a, you know, is being funded by the NHS, and um, they are a medical experiment on kids. But yeah, the, the, the drag thing is, it's kind of paedophilia in plain sight. I mean, it's not its not hiding in plain sight. Mm -mm. It just is in plain sight for all to see. And how anyone can go along with it, I've just no idea. It's really gross. It, it is, we live in such weird times in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, in some ways, I'm kind of like, okay, I don't get this thing or I don't approve of it, but I'm kind of like, whatever. But again, when stuff starts treading on other people's toes or involving children, then I become pretty hard line. I'm just like, no, that's not acceptable. You cannot, you, you, you can't do this, right? It's just, it's just wrong. I, I don't, like, there are very basic principles that I, operate off of, right? I've got like a, a moral framework and some things are gray areas, but there are just some lines that should not be crossed. And I don't think people should be televising it and celebrating it. And you're writing articles about how wonderful this is. And they always use this word pro progress. And I'm like, how, how, how is this progress, right? Not everything, not every change is progress, right? Yeah. Not every change is progress. So you know, there there are some things that exist for a reason, and certain things that have been away for a reason, right? There's a there's a reason men, men's and women's sports are segregated. That's mm. not that's not done because of bigotry and because men hate women or women hate men. It's done because if you don't do it, 
female professional sport as we know it would not exist. Mm -hmm. Because if you're just going to take the best of the best and have everyone competing with everyone in strength and in speed and whatever, as we already said, the men are going to win. So it's like, no, let women have their own competition and the best of the women will be the best of the women. The best of the men can be the best of the men. You don't start blurring the mo maybe you can do that if you're doing sports with like five or six year olds and you know the differences are well, very mild but five and six year olds but even like the the thing i mean i'm not sporty i've never played any sports i've mm -hmm. never liked it but there are reasons that women don't like sports and it's often to do with puberty and it's a bit horrible to be running around and feeling like you're being looked at and it's a very different world for women and uh, you know in comparison to men when it comes to most things, but certainly in sport. However, for girls that do participate in sport, they need that sport to be theirs because there's so much to be gained. You know, we're in an age where girls are starving themselves or having their breasts cut off because they can't stand their bodies. We need girls to understand what their bodies are for. And it's not just to be looked at. In fact, it's not to be looked at at all. They are to run fast to catch a ball, to um, sort of the, the team uh, benefits of belonging to like a women's football team or a rugby team and having that camaraderie and it, all of those things are missed. And at the moment, the sporting debate has talked a lot about testosterone. I mean, Sharon Davies has been very good, but they talk about male bodied or they use these weird euphemisms. They just need to say the word men yeah. it's not a difficult word it's one that we've been quite used to using for a really long time and men and women not male bodied mm. not born male they are men and so we need to if we can stick to that language it becomes far less easy to allow these men in women's sports because once you say trans women male bodied transsexuals all these things it totally ruins the very clear message that they are men. It's true. Well, leftists are masters of language manipulation. To be to be frank, this is I can think of I can think of a whole list of terms and euphemisms that um, people use for, you know, essentially to to reframe conversations. It's very clever. It's something it's something I see a lot in a lot of conversations, and it's really just clever use of language using euphemisms instead of using proper terms to kind of obfuscate and slightly change the message. But then over years, over decades, it's like people just kind of accept it and they're like, oh, okay, this is uh, this, is this this is that. And it's, it's interesting with me as someone who's just very observant and analytical. I, I look at debates, I look at discussions, and I'm always looking at the terminology people are using. And the, it, it tends to try to frame the debate in a way that fits their side, because obviously, if you are talking about someone who is biologically a man, chromosomally a man, in you know, born a man in every in every way, shape, and form, but then you can use the term, um, you can use the term, well, either just straight woman or female or even trans woman, anything closer to the term woman, and yeah. same the other way around, then it makes it reframes the conversation because then it's like, oh well. Is it a woman? Maybe, maybe it looks like a. You know, in some cases, it looks like a woman. So, why? Why do we? You know, and then again, it's always try to put through a frame of if you're not on this side, you are not compassionate, or you are, or even worse, you're hateful, you're transphobic. That's another word that's recently been invented. That word did not exist before, right? Transphobia. That's a new word. Right? That's, 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 according to anybody that uses that word. I'm definitely transphobic. I don't think we <laughs> women. So that's. I mean, we we shouldn't embrace it. I'll embrace that label if oh, it means <laughs> if I can just speak the truth yeah. and say that men can't be women and transitioning children is abuse. I'll take the transphobic label and I will understand that it means absolutely nothing mm. apart from being able to label things, uh, you know, with the language that they should be should yeah. be. It, it's all just a tactic. It's all a tactic. Like these labels are used: uh, transphobe, racist, bigot, Nazi, um, yeah. Islamophobe, um, mm -hmm. some kind of supremacist. Um, what What are the other ones? Uh, homophobic, of course. Like even if you're again, even if you're not talking about 
these issues or exhibiting any kind of hatred or unfair discrimination or anything towards an individual or group, the tactic is always just, okay, we need to, this, this person is saying something that goes against the ideology. So we need to slap a label, even better if you can slap a couple, right? If you can hit someone with all four of them, then it's like, you just need to, you can just dismiss what they're saying. That's, that's a hateful person. That's a bigot. Forget mm -hmm. about everything they're saying. They're the worst of the worst. And it's such a, it's such an unfair and dishonest tactic. And it's used every single day. I see it what? all the time. It really works. I was recently by a woman who's a BBC producer. And um, she she put a status after the new, it might have been the day of those people that got killed in New Zealand in the mosque, right? Might have been the day or certainly the day after. And she put a status up saying, I regret not posting this before because I was a little bit worried about uh, caught rocking the boat, but uh, I'm going to post this now uh, in the light of what happened in New Zealand. And then it was so <laughs> someone saying, if you speak with the Christian right, if you talk with uh, the Heritage Foundation, which is people, I, I went to an event of theirs, they're Christian conservative American mm -hmm. um, think tank. If you um, share right-wing articles from like the Daily Mail or the Federalist or Breitbart, then you are, or if you're Posey Parker and you think, or one of her crew, then I was basically responsible for what happened in New Zealand. Oh, wow. Oh, what? You were, you were name-checked as well. I was name-checked as one of the reasons that people in New Zealand were gunned down by a terrorist, despicable human who, you know, apparently I feed into the narrative. Because I'm all of the things that you can accuse somebody of. It's insane. I don't see how, I mean, I'm glad that people are waking up to it. I'm really glad that people are waking up to it, especially when it's people who do considerably, sorry, especially when it's people who do genuinely, for the most part, consider themselves more liberal or left leaning. Because it's like, okay, cool. If I'm like, if y'all are starting to see it, because I've, I've seen it for years. <laughs> And people are sometimes like, oh, you're exaggerating this or you're exaggerating that or you're being too alarmist or whatever. And I'm like, no, like this is this is like to me, it's it's like plain as day. I'm like, you can see what people are doing. It's happening in the news. They do it in the news. They yeah. do it in the media. People do it on social media. And it's just this constant just it's it's just like a game. But once you understand the game and the tactics, it becomes so, so plainly obvious. It's like, OK, you don't have an argument. So your argument is to slap this label on someone or to insult this person or to scream or try to deplatform this person or whatever. And it's always coming from the same end. Like I don't try to be deeply politically partisan or biased, but I'm just like, this is only happening. I'm not seeing I'm not seeing conservatives trying to deplatform liberal speakers at universities or or get liberals thrown off of Twitter or shut down on Facebook or get their bank accounts shut down. You know what I mean? It's just like it's always in the one direction. And Again, when you're when you're trying to claim to be the side of tolerance and kindness and compassion and non bigotry, and then you're you're acting in all these ways. And if a black person disagrees with you, then you're calling them racial slurs. If a woman disagrees with you, you're calling her misogynistic slurs. If I'm just like, wait, hang on, you know, I've had um, I'm I've got you know a pretty big Twitter following, and I'm followed by such a broad range of people. And I've had people, for example, like like gay people who have messaged me and been like, yeah, I've kind of been like disowned or kicked out of the LGBT community because I don't stand for this or because I have a conservative view on that or whatever. And it's like, yeah, they're not even, they're, they're not for gay people per se. They're not even for these people. They're just for this dogmatic ideology and anyone who stands for it. It doesn't actually matter whether or not you could be placed in that box. They just want you to follow these rules it is very much just a secular religion and it's it's a fanatical religion as well. I'd say, you know, being a religious person, <laughs> I would actually say that uh, these people are far more fundamentalist and fanatical and radical than the vast majority of traditionally religious people that I know because they're trying to ram the ideology down on everybody else. Whereas most religious people, certainly in the modern era, are kind of, you know, live, live and let live. This is what I believe, but I'm not going to force you to believe what I believe. I'm not gonna go and try to change the law so that everything that's against my religion is now against the law. Um, and yeah. if someone were to do that, they'd rightly be considered 
a radical or an extremist? Well, there's a really strange thing happening with education. I mean, I, I think it's been happening for a really long time. But, uh, you know, we've now got primary schools talking about LGBT. Now, I think that the, the rule in primary school should be do as you're told, learn what you're supposed to learn. Um, I don't understand all this PSHE and needing special lessons to tell people how to behave. I think that should be indicative in the way the school is run. Um, and respect and respect your elders and all those sorts of things should be, that should help a school. I, this, this idea that then you need a special book about two, pen, two male penguins adopting a rock to show children there's different families, I don't know why you need to do that. Why not just ensure that you stop the homophobic language, which I think is probably the biggest thing that happens in school, is everything's gay. And, um, you know, people do use, kids today use far worse language, uh, homophobic language than I ever did. So you can eradicate that. But I don't, I don't really understand why at primary school we're talking about very complicated or those sorts of issues at all. Mm. Um, and then we've got an LGBT health czar. I mean, I don't know. I thought straight people and gay people had the same anatomies. I don't really know why we need a special focus for LGB, certainly not LGB health. Uh, T, um, that can be the only thing. You know, do gay men have different health problems to straight men? I would there, there's, there's certainly a higher risk of certain diseases. Well, trans, uh, trans uh, men that call themselves women have the highest HIV rate. Mm. So maybe you'd have, yeah, but I, still, I mean, it, we sort of tried to say in the 1980s and 90s that it wasn't something that, you know, it wasn't something that um, homosexual men particularly got and everyone was called homophobic for saying that it was a, predominantly a disease that affected that community. And now we've got a bloody health czar that's specifically for that community. It's just bonkers. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, if that was what was said in the 80s and 90s, that's obviously that obviously was a lie. And that's very ideologically driven as well. I mean, the thing is for, it's the best way to put it. I mean, for certain ideologies to take root, you have to shut down opposing voices, you have to shut down debate, you have to hide the facts, basically, because once the facts come out, you can see that certain positions are not tenable, if we're talking about objective reality. It yeah. doesn't, again, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's such a shame that in the modern time, you have to put a disclaimer on everything that you say, because people are always trying to find something that they can take out of context or yeah. apply some kind of hatred to you you know say that oh you're you're coming from a place of hate or your hatred or it it's like look i have no hate in my heart for anybody like it's i there's no there's no hate whatsoever you're just kind of saying this is this is reality if you believe something different and you want to go and do something different again it's like god bless you you know go go do do what you feel makes you happy. If you are a grown man and wearing lipstick and heels and putting on a dress makes you happy, you have a right to do so. You don't have a right to tell me and to try to force me or to legislate that I must believe that you are actually a man. Like I, I have to. And it's because it's like, no, mate, you're you're not. I mean, you can you can do what you want. I'll probably even, you know, I mean, if I'm with you just out of common courtesy, if you want me to, to refer to you as she, I actually probably will just to avoid being impolite to someone. But if I'm talking to you and kind of in, in another context and I'm talking about a man, I'm going to say he because that's that's the objective reality. We um, don't use pronouns, do we? If, I mean, I'm not going to, we'll have, I could talk to you for the next 12 hours and there won't be a single moment at which I refer to you in any, so the pronouns in front of someone and I, None of that makes sense. Yeah. The only time we use pronouns is when we talk about someone. So, so basically, these people are saying, I want you to refer to me. When you're talking to someone else, I want you to refer to me as he, she. Um, personally, I don't do people's pronouns. I will do people's names because mm. names are names. Yeah. But I, don't, um, I think it's 
I think it's impolite to demand that I go along with an ideology I fundamentally disagree with. Yeah, I'd agree with you. And I mean, to be honest, in in majority of cases, like keeping it 100, I would just refer to someone as what they genuinely look like, right? Yeah. If, if, you know, I mean, you do have people who have gone through a decade plus of hormone therapy and they've had surgeries and whatever, and it's like, okay, you are essentially indistinguishable from a woman, right? So if that's the case, I mean, unless I unless I did research on them, I probably wouldn't know. I'd just say, okay, that, that woman, she, whatever, because you're cl you've clearly been so dedicated. Right. You're you're, th you're that dedicated to the cause, right? I know that your chromosomes. It, sorry. Women know. Women can spot men a lot easier okay. than you guys can. That, um, that, <laughs> that's interesting. I, I I have seen I have seen a handful where I was like, whoa, really? Um, Did they walk? Though? Were they walking? Uh, no, this is based primarily off of uh, photos. Well, if you think of someone like Munro Bergdorf or Paris Lees, both of those would be argued because Munro's had his brow, like his face pulled back and his brow shaved and he's had loads of work done. In fact, he looks whiter than he's ever looked as well. I think he might be mixed race, I'm not sure, but he, he looks, he's gone from a, a black 15-year-old boy to... Um, a white uh, woman of nearly 30. I don't think he looks uh, female in pictures. I mean, he probably does, but then when you see him in the flesh, it's a totally different thing. Mm. I just, um, I don't think any of them pass. And I've, I've seen a, a fair few in the flesh, but even if, even if they did, if I know somebody to be male, then I will think of them as male. And, and I, it, it is, I think as, as, a, as a woman, as you grow up, you have, you develop intuition. I think men do as well, but I think women are far more uh, good at it, to be honest. Um, and we develop intuition because we have more perceived threats. That is not to say that we are victims of violence more than men, because I know that's not true, but we are victims of violence from men Mm -hmm. And men are victims of violence from other men. And so I know that it's not a fair thing because women are weaker and generally smaller. And so if a man wants to cause me harm, he's going to cause me a lot more harm than he would cause you and a lot more harm than a woman would cause me. So we develop, I think we have, you know, intuition is making a thousand decisions that you don't even do consciously, isn't it? So... Um, if someone's walking behind me, then I probably intuitively know how far away they are, how quickly they're walking, whether they're speed pick, all those little things are like a hundred decisions that I'm making. Um, so catcalling, for example, I've been out where I was in my late thirties and a group of very drunk men when I was walking to my car surrounded me and started singing Lady in Red because I had a red jacket on. Um, and they were obviously really highly intelligent and uh, inventive men. So they, <laughs> they surrounded me and they started singing Lady in Red. And what you do in that situation, and maybe you've had it before where blokes have been a bit aggressive with you when you're out, and you have to think, you probably would have a different set of decisions. I have to think, do I smile? If I smile, am I encouraging? If I don't smile, am I being cold? Is that going to make them aggressive? Who are the drunk? Who are the most drunk men? Who are the men that are likely to let me through? Who are the men that look uncomfortable and probably are just going to let me pass without kind of grabbing me or saying any more or, you know, and what you have to do as a, as a female is you have to play this game of, how am I most going to get out of this unscathed? And that's what women have to do all the time with male attention. Because often if a bloke says something to a woman and you tell him to, to go away, mm. um, he might get really aggressive. And so, and it's very funny, being married, that's a very good way to make men back off because somebody else, it was somebody else's property. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! You used the word property. That's going to upset some people. Well, it's, you know, <laughs> it belong to someone else, and actually, that's I. I think subconsciously, those men feel that they're insulting my husband yeah. more than me, 
So I've walked into a place before and this guy goes, oh, you're classy, you're just my sort of woman. And I'm like, yeah, I'm really not. And then he said, um, oh, don't you want to be friendly? What's your name? So I just said, well, I'm Mrs. Minchel, because my real name is Kelly J. Keen Minchel. I was like, I'm Mrs. Minchel. And he's like, oh, sorry about that. Just straight away. Because I'm, yeah. you know, I'm married, therefore I'm respectable. Yeah, it's really funny. That's one thing that um, I think a lot of... What, what I have a I have a lot of criticisms of what I consider or what I see represented as modern day feminism, mm. and one of them is I mean we we've touched on a whole bunch of them, but some of them are just I don't know if it's ignorance or naivety or denial of some of these basic gender interactions, right? The there is um you know if someone wants to say that there's some kind of generalized male experience of the world and a generalized female experience, I, I would agree. I mean, being a man is certainly different than being a woman in a, in a whole bunch of ways. There are things that I can try to empathize with and have compassion for, but that position, like you just said you were in, I know that I'm not likely to find myself ever in that position. Yeah. And and also there are positions that I'm, I, I will find myself in, or I may find myself in, that a woman is very unlikely to find herself in. I mean, I'd say for a woman, it's probably, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I would say that it, it would be a lot easier for you to get through life without being in a physical fight. Right? Yes. If you're If you're a man, most guys at some point in their lives, maybe when you're younger, like there will be a physical altercation where there'll just be another guy who, or a group of another guys. And that, you know, it's, that's kind of part of being, it's part of being a man. So as a, as a guy, you kind of know there are certain rules and you're also aware of the potential threat, especially me. I'm a, I'm a big, strong guy, right? So I'm aware if I'm, especially if I'm around women or I'm walking down the street late at night or whatever, I'm aware that they may per perceive me as a potential threat. Yes. And they probably, and they should, not because I'm a bad guy, but because they just know, okay, there's a, there's a big man approaching me. That's more of a pot potential threat than a 15 year old girl approaching me. That's not based on sexism. That's not, you know, some people, that's not based on racism. That, that's, that's just, it kind of is what it is. You know, certain things are just reality. So what you said there about you being married and you said that, yeah, guys kind of, will generally, unless a guy's like a real, real, real creep, they'll generally kind of like respect that and back off because you just know these are these are the lines these are the boundaries so when you had a uh, more traditional ideas of like okay not having if you've got a teenage daughter wanting her to go out with a male friend or the idea of a man walking a woman back home mm. after after a late night you know that that's just basic that's based on reality and on security it's not yeah. you know I've, I've heard this concept of what do they call it benevolent sexism which is the idea that if I if I hold the door open for a woman or I pull out a chair for her, this is somehow demeaning. I'm now being sexist because I'm I'm assuming that she can't do these things, and I'm just like, no, I'm just like, well, what what's wrong with you people? Like, not everything is not like in general. People like to use the word misogyny. I know very few men who actually hate women. Like, it's not. In fact, I, I know no men who hate women, and I've come across very few who do. It's it's like these. Some of these things are just based on actual like yeah trying to be trying to be courteous or trying to be polite or just trying to be decent yeah i do know women i and one person i knew got very very angry with a guy who wanted to walk her to her car at three o'clock in the morning now mm. i have no i don't care i don't care about people carrying opening doors i don't i i don't really see any of those things as an affront to me being female i think it's just polite I do. I do quite a few of those things for a man too. Just FYI. Yeah. I would. I would open a door if I was <laughs> and somebody was coming behind me. I'd open the door. I wouldn't. You know. I wouldn't then expect a man to feel emasculated because a woman's opened a door. As much as I, a woman shouldn't be offended. It, it's there's um. It's quite a. It's it's a funny old thing where sometimes people take things to a very illogical conclusion you know the 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 fact that i know that we um have touched on this before but i do think 
that the way men treat women in our everyday and the fact that I'm far more likely to have sexual kind of sexual harassment full stop but certainly someone chatting out of the van or all those things I do think that is a product of a sexist society however I don't think a man shouting out of a van to ask me to take off a piece of clothing is anything to do with a guy opening a door for me I don't think they're the same remotely the same things mm. one is a man who doesn't see women as a as full human beings and therefore he can share his very mundane view of that woman whenever he so desires that's one thing mm. and the other one who's someone who thinks it would be quite nice to hold a door open <laughs> for someone I'm going to do that yeah but according to some people both of those things are sexism and well, this is um, this is why when I'm like this is why we can't have nice things absolutely. because if <laughs> it's like damned if you do damned if you don't it's like okay well if I do this, I'm sexy. If I don't do that, I still call me sexy. I'm just like, look, I mean, one, one reason I'm, I'm very happy to kind of air my thoughts and just put my thoughts out there without fear is because I know that genuinely I have no hatred, unfair discrimination, bigotry, whatever in my heart towards any individual or group of people. Yeah. So I'm happy to talk freely because I'm not worried that something is going to like slip out there that, yeah. oh crap, I revealed that I actually do hate women. It's like, no, like I know, I know I don't, right? I've got, like, it's, it's the, if anything, it's, it's the opposite. Perhaps I like them too much. Um, and it's just weird. I just feel like in the current society we live in, this is something I've spoken about on a few episodes of my podcast and certainly talked about on social media is that there just seems to be this constant attempt to drive a wedge and create division between groups. I mean, me men and women are the two, like the fact that those, you know, we're sexually dimorphous, dimorphic species. And the fact that you've got those two complementary parts of the human species, you've got those two genders. It's literally the reason why we exist, right? Without that, we cease to exist. Like people stop mating, people stop reproducing, everything stops. So I'm kind of like, why is there this huge attempt to drive, you know, create anger, you know, get men hating women or get women who hate men, and you're just constantly battling each other. And I'm kind of like, it's not hard. sorry, say that again. We've all got to hate white men, you know, very privileged white men. I, mm. I really like to in my town where there's quite a lot of very low income households, I'd like to go and tell those white men that they're really privileged. Oh yeah, I, I whenever I see um, a homeless white guy on the street, I, I, especially if he's straight, I tell you know I, I take his sign and tell him to check his privilege. Well, someone said to me about hating all white men, I was like, I'm married to one and I've given birth. <laughs> <laughs> I really hate white men. Oh gosh. And, Talk about the power of white men when actually most people in this country are equally as powerful or powerless. Yeah. There's not many of us that are really making full decisions about our lives without the permission of others. It's mm. it's a really and that's a really lefty thing that that's gone very very wrong. Like yeah. identity politics. I'm with you. I'm with you a million percent. It's gone way. It's insane. It's insane. I mean, <laughs> I, I basically, I remember one of the viral tweets I had last year was basically just something like, um, was it last year or this year? I kind of just said something like, I'm tired of like white, I literally said, like, I'm tired of white men being demonized, right? If you can demonize, I thought we'd have learned by now to just stop demonizing various groups. And then I put something like, yeah, you know, some of you in history have been assholes has, as have, you know, individuals from every every yeah. every possible group but in general i was just like yeah i've got no beef and then i put like god bless white men at the end of it or something and it got such a strong reaction and i was like wow i, I this is i'm basically saying like it's wrong to hate <laughs> to hate white guys <laughs> and, and and some people were opposed to me some people some people were saying i'm, I'm there trying to i'm there uh trying to re reinforce the the dominance hierarchy or something and i'm just like you are so brainwashed like what is how can you just walk around every day and perceive the world like that? Just look, you've got individuals. Some people are, some people are great. Some people aren't so great. Some people are nice. Some people aren't so nice. Just, I don't care. I don't care about their race, their sexuality. Their, I like, I'm like, is this not what you're supposed to be preaching? 
<laughs> this is the thing, like, the hypocrisy. What amazes me about these people when they spew this stuff that everybody else spews and they're supposed to spew, um, they never ask who it serves. Like when they when they go along with this stuff, who actually benefits and who does this narrative serve? And I've raised these questions before and then been called um, all sorts of you know <laughs> of names, the FAW dictionary of insults. Mm. Um, uh, but you have to ask, like. Uh, even the most odious of characters, uh, who um, you know, you have to you have to ask why have they been elevated to a particular position? Why have I got to hate white men? Why is it that at the end of some of these Brexit marches or whatever, you just hone in on the thugs when I know people, educated, decent human beings, who just thought at the end of it they didn't agree with the lack of democracy of the EU. I voted to remain, but I don't like the anti-democratic nature in which we're not serving what we promised and we should never have asked the people if we weren't going to do it. And I'll just take, you know, I'll we'll leave and none of us will know whether it's a good decision for about two decades. You know, it might be the worst thing in the world. That, but that's my exact position, literally my exact position on Brexit. Right. Well, yeah. we've got so much in common. Um, <laughs> it, I'm not an adult human female, though. <laughs> well, not today. Not, not, yeah, well, actually, I was in the gym this morning, and uh, <laughs> it's so. And it's very interesting. The um, the the thing with the Brexit thing, how you they keep focusing on these morons, for want of a better word, but these sort of lightish men. Um, and they're trying to frame that as they're the people that voted to leave Europe. And it's not just those people or elderly people who aren't even going to be around to see the benefits. Mm -hmm. You think, when did we start thinking that older people have don't have the life experience to make a good decision? Uh, and then these will be the people who then turn around and decry ageism at the next uh, at their next thing. Oh, yeah. It is. It it is bananas. It's bananas. Like I'm like I say, I'm I'm cool with different opinions. I'm happy to talk about issues and have different points of view on things. But what annoys me is hypocrisy. You know, I'm I just get annoyed by hypocrisy. I'm like, look, if you're gonna have a position, at least be don't contradict it in the next sentence. Do you know what I mean? Don't say that you're fighting racism and then talk about how terrible white men are. <laughs> yeah. you, you see what I mean? Don't don't say that you're. It, it's just. It's like, come on, man. Like, just don't say that you're um you're tolerant and you want diversity, and then hate someone because they disagree with you or deplatform them because they disagree with you on what the tax rate should be. You know what I mean? It's just like these things don't they they don't make sense. But um, again, as I said, I do think that uh, I think that sunlight. I think that light is sort of penetrating through the matrix and people are starting to see it for what it is and the madness might get a little bit worse but i do honestly think that it'll it'll come back around to kind of like a sane happy medium where everyone's just kind of like maybe, maybe people just need to grow grow just tired of it all and just be like you know what like let's just can we just reset can we throw identity politics in the trash can we throw like some of these bizarre progressive ideas that are actually regressive can we just throw these in the bin can we just go back to normal, sane society where we don't prejudge each other and hate each other and refuse to talk to anybody who may disagree with us on something? Because if we do that, then we're not going to talk to anybody, are we? No, no. We, um, when I went to America, that we were criticized heavily for, well, it, there was a, somebody put a blog post out, it was a big fat lie that I had, um, I was working with the Heritage Foundation, which was a Christian conservative think tank and I, I wasn't I was attending a meeting that was organized by women who had lost their daughters to the trans cult so these were women one of the one of the women's daughters had gone to Oregon at 15 and got a double mastectomy wow. without her parents consent and a radical hysterectomy and then she was homeless at 18 sleeping on the streets because she hated her parents so these are the women that wanted to put platform left-wing feminist voices um, 
talking because the Heritage Foundation does have its, you know, is well respected. And I watched a room full of Christian conservatives give a lesbian radical feminist a standing ovation. And it's surprised. Very, it, well, it, it's very interesting because we were criticized even though I had nothing to do with it, but these women were criticized for talking to the Heritage Foundation. But actually what happened in that room is some people did move their opinion, but it wasn't the women talking. It was those people who were able to listen, who probably had never considered um, themselves the sort of person to give a lesbian a standing ovation. You know, some of those people would have had really firm views about um, marriage equality and so on. Mm -hmm. And the the benefit and the influence that that woman had the potential to make in that room was so much bigger than than any of us being polluted with some of the things that we you know definitely fundamentally will not agree on but it was it was really respectful and nobody on the right as far as i know so no people that were fans of the heritage foundation thought that the heritage foundation were wrong for platforming a lesbian um, and left-wing radical feminist ideas. They didn't get criticized, but the left was so angry. Mm. I got like a, um, a list of the most known academic feminists in this country criticizing me for going to the Heritage Foundation. Yeah. It's, it, 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 I wish I could say it surprised me, but it, it doesn't. <laughs> It, it 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 doesn't surprise me one that those people turned out to be a lot more tolerant to opposing viewpoints than some people may think. Yeah. And two, it doesn't surprise me that the backlash was from the other end of the spectrum, because mm. that's I mean I've seen this play out for so many different yeah. people so many different times, and I'm always like, okay, so who's really being tolerant here? <laughs> you know, like like to tolerance isn't just tolerate. Like the definition of tolerance is yeah being able to tolerate be able to tolerate and accept views that are different to mm. yours and people who are different to you if if you're just in like a little bubble and everybody agrees with you on everything that's not tolerance tolerance is having someone come up from outside it and be like okay well i disagree on that and instead of insulting them or attacking them or throwing them out or just taking away their ability to speak freely you're like hmm okay let's listen Okay, well, we disagree with this. Okay, okay, no, we agree with, with that, and it's it's cool. It's just it's just decency. It's really it's literally just decency. I'm not saying that everyone needs to, you know, I'm not saying that everyone with left leaning political views needs to switch over and become ultra conservative or vice versa or whatever. It's just like, look, like you need to have this dialogue because once dialogue breaks down in a society, you're screwed because you've only got three options: you can talk, you can segregate, or you can fight. That's it. There's only three options. And that goes from like individual relationships to sort of national, international scales. As soon as, you know, talks break down, what's the next step? Okay, well, you're not listening. We're not listening. We're gonna, we're gonna fight. That's what it comes down to. And I think that whether or not people know it, it, just, it does seem like that's what some people want. Mm -hmm. And that's what I find disturbing. Cause I'm like, why would you refuse to I mean, this one thing I love about doing this podcast is because I've spoken to so many, you know, every week I'm talking to all these range of different people with different ideas and perspectives. And it's cool because it's just like, look, I'm, I'll talk to anybody. Like, I, I, I'm trying to almost like think of someone or, or something that, you know, I probably wouldn't have some kind of like, um, you know, I wouldn't want to have someone on here who's like advocating for, for violence or, <laughs> or yeah. you know, something like that. But apart from that, I'm like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, if you've got an interesting perspective, come on, like, let's, let's how, talk. Weak, how weak must somebody's argument be if they cannot talk about it? You know, I can talk about any of my views because A, I don't pin my whole world on them. So mm. I, am, I am okay with changing my mind. It doesn't, I don't feel like I'm flawed or I'm weak if I change my mind. But also, I know that the opinions I hold firmly, I've taken a long time to get to my position. I mean, I, I, I didn't take a long time to know that men can't be women. I think I just, I have, I just think it's like, you know, if you stand in the rain, you're going to get wet. It's, I don't need to take a long time for those positions. But rain, rain is a social construct though. 
Rain is such a <laughs> It is, because you just think yourself dry, exactly. you're all right. <laughs> um, it's just, it's, it's very weird when people don't want to talk. I feel quite terrible about the fact that free speech, I thought that was something that everybody wanted. I had no idea, apart from in sort of totalitarian regimes, that free speech would not be a fundamental human right and need. And the people that need it the most are the people at the bottom of the pile. They need to be able to complain about the way they're being treated. They need to raise their voices and name and label things that are happening to them. So it's not a preserve of the privilege to be able to say what they want. It's the preserve of the people right at the bottom. So why that wouldn't be a left-wing ideal, I, I don't know. Well, they've kind of taken that a step further. So they've said that it's the people in their perceived victim hierarchy at the bottom who do have the right to free speech, but those at the top, those aforementioned straight white males, et cetera, et cetera, do not because they're at the top of the pile, so their free speech must be silenced. I mean, you you literally hear people say stuff like this. You literally say, yeah, yeah like men need to shut up so that women can speak or white people need to shut up so people of color can speak. I've, I've literally heard people say that in those words. And I'm just like, it's what? Like the pro -life, <laughs> pro life debate, which I know you and I are very much on, well, not very much, but I know that you have different views to me on, on abortion. Mm. And I still, it's weird, but I still think that even though you don't have a womb or a uterus, you're entitled to an opinion about. I, I, I can, I can still make a baby. You, you can still, just not. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't birth it. But um, <laughs> you know, every, all, every one of those babies, you know, men are half of the equation. So the, the, the notion that men shouldn't even have an opinion is frankly oh. ridiculous to me. I mean, maybe you don't really have an opinion on menstruation or um, whether or no. not tax women's uh, sanitary products, but I can't really think of anything that I would like to ring fence as only a certain type of person can talk about it. I, I certainly wouldn't think that I should talk instead of others. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, you know, if there were two people in a room and we were talking about disabilities, and one of us was in a wheelchair and the other of us had no disabilities whatsoever, then I would say that that other person should definitely be able to speak instead of me, but not, but not that that person is the only person allowed to speak about that issue. Yeah. Uh, we've really gone into some really funny places. Uh, like yeah. a friend of put on a, she put on, something against pornography and it was uh, talking about um, the damage that it does to women, the post-traumatic stress disorder and all this stuff to do with porn. And she invited this woman who's like a very well-known um, black, very young, she seems a lot younger than she is, I think, feminist from Scotland. She sort of writes like a 15 year old. And she said, oh, I, I can't possibly come on because working class women aren't represented on the panel. Now, what don't, so she couldn't belong because it wasn't diverse enough. Now, what she fails to, to think about is that working class women often are too bloody busy working to be having a little jolly and going giving a talk to a bunch of women in a room on a Saturday afternoon because it might be the only day that they've got to do their housework or spend with their kids. So you have to have other people's voices talking about stuff because often other people can't do it, won't do it, or can't be part of it for whatever reason, or maybe, just maybe for a working class woman, her priority is having enough money to go around, not whether or not men are watching porn. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Awesome, Posey. We've uh, we've been talking for a while. I think uh, I definitely want to get you back on the get you back on the podcast again. But I I'm wary for having this go on for too long for this one. So I think we'll um we'll come back to it again. But let the listeners know where they can find you. So I'm permanently banned from Twitter forever. IP address, so not on Twitter, but I'm on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube as Posey Parker or the Posey Parker. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Posey. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And um, what have you got coming up next? 
Um, well, I've just done a, I'm going to release a video for the breast book that we, uh, there was a breast book for pubescent girls and that included a section on um, binding. So we're, we're doing a bit on that. I've got a massive protest uh, planned and literature to go with it. Then I've got three talks all in very lovely, special places. And so, yeah, I'm busy. Awesome. Posey Parker, thank you for joining Real Talk with Zuby. <laughs>